I am to be here uh, with you <clears throat> today. I uh, was here doing a um, weekend series on, what was it, interpreting the Bible? Was that four years ago? Sixteen. Wow. Took you five years to let me come back. <laughs> okay. And I regret so that I was not able to be here in June. I had been looking forward to being with you, and then, lo and behold, I had a had a bone fracture uh, that uh, turned loose some way or the other and got against a nerve, and some of you know um, about that. You don't do much, you know, when you've got something on a, on a nerve on your back. And so uh, June the 1st, I had surgery, immediate relief. How many of you had some back surgery before? It's immediate, isn't it? <coughs> it was for me, anyway. And so um, I... I think I had 15 or 20 meetings this year. I don't, Linda knows better than I do, but anyway, um, so I, you all rearranged, but I lost a couple. I had six appointments that I had to cancel, and then we got COVID in the end of July. So we are living proof that we had. The, I had the Pfizer vaccine in February. Linda had the Moderna in March, and we both got COVID in July. So. <clears throat> Excuse me. We have, we think, plenty of antibodies. <laughs> so uh, we're glad to be with you all and look forward to spending a few days with you. Thanks to the elders, especially for <clears throat> your consideration in uh, postponing the meeting. Um, it, the <clears throat> wind was just taken out of my sails, you know, when I had to call Dennis that day and have that discussion. But at any rate, thank you all so very, very much for doing that. All right, now let's get down to what I <clears throat> enjoy doing. Got a little tickle here in my throat. It's probably, I think it's your dryness. We've been having to deal with floods in Tennessee, and here you're dry, right? <clears throat> so there's something in the air, but I'll get adjusted to it soon. Let me see your Bible. May I see your Bibles? Hold them up high. Good, good. Okay, some don't have a Bible, that's sad. Let us know, and we'll see that you get one. Isn't that right? We'll go to the bookstore or whatever we got to do to get you one. Bring your Bible. We're going to be studying the Bible this week on walking with Jesus. <clears throat> Before the Lord Jesus ascended into heaven, he gave what we have traditionally called the Great Commission. It's actually recorded in all four Gospels. A lot of people don't know of the occurrence in the Gospel of John. And it's also, I think, in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where Paul told Timothy you know, to commit to things that he had received to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. But I want to use Matthew chapter 28 for my lesson this morning. All authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Notice that the main emphasis of this passage is to go make disciples. Isn't that what the Lord said? You make disciples. And how do you do it, Lord? By baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the and the Holy Spirit. So, <clears throat> this morning, we want to talk about being a disciple. Are you a disciple? Now, I can hear a few of you perhaps saying to yourself, well, Brother David, I'm here. <laughs> I'm in Bible class. I'll be here for worship this morning. I'm going to come back tonight, and I plan to be back the rest of the week. Don't you think I'm a disciple? Are you a disciple? How do we find out if indeed we are disciples? I think we've got to go to the book. What do you think? Now here's what I want to do for the time that we have this morning. I want us to look at seven passages of Scripture in the New Testament, all of which have, now watch it, listen to it now, all of which have the word disciple in it, okay? And, the, and we're going to have about three points. The first point is going to be the goal of a disciple, all right? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. The second point will have to do with the marks of a disciple. 
And all of these will be found in the Gospel of John. The former will be in the Gospel of Luke. And then we're going to close with looking at the cost of being a disciple. And these three verses will be found in the Gospel of Luke. Isn't that kind of cool? Seven verses of Scripture, all of which have the word disciple in it. Now that's the best way to find out if we're a disciple or not. Amen? All right, y'all help me. Give me a little love, you know, here. And Dennis said, I'm from Mississippi. He mispronounced it. He said Mississippi, you know, like some kind of fancy pants person. But I was born and raised in Mississippi. All of us know it's three syllables. You know, we Southerners drag our words and we accentuate the first syllable. I know you're supposed to say police, but I still find myself saying the police. I can't help it. But anyway... The first point has to do with the goal of a disciple. Look at the book of Luke, chapter 6, and verse number 40. The Bible says, A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. And so a disciple then is someone who is a learner. But a disciple is more than a learner. A disciple is a person who is an adherent. He is a person who imitates. The master. Now, we're going to talk about that in great detail tonight when we look at four passages of Scripture about imitating Christ. But a disciple is someone who seeks to be like Jesus. Dennis, it's an overwhelming thought to me when I read Romans 8 and 29 where the Bible says that God predestined from all eternity, now watch this, that we would be conformed to the image of Christ. You think about that. And in 2 Corinthians 3.18, we're going to look at tonight, says we are transforming into the image of Christ. And so it's just an overwhelming concept to me to think that God in heaven expects us to conform to the very image of Christ. Now we know we can't do that in the sense of being sinless, but short of that, we're supposed to be more like Jesus every day day, every month, every year of our life. So the goal of a a disciple is to be like Jesus. Now, are you a disciple? Well, let's go to the Gospel of John and find out. The first passage, I'd like to hear some pages rustling. Uh, Of course, Ms. Light can't do it over here because she's on an iPad. But I like listening to that. Listen, you just can't beat it, can you? Somebody ought to invent an app, you know, that has pages rustling when you look up verses or something. Okay, <clears throat> let's look at John chapter 8, verse 31. You ready? <clears throat> this is our second verse with the word disciple. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my what? Talk to me. You are my disciples indeed. So we find out that the first mark or trait of a disciple is someone who abides in the Word. But that raises the question, what does it mean to abide in the Word? Well, I think a few verses that uh, might apply here would be like 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord. So abiding in the Word means to be growing in the knowledge and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, It would involve something like uh, Acts 17 and 11 where the Bereans were more noble than the Thessalonians. Why? Because they searched the scriptures. They did it how often? Daily to see if the things were so. So like you, during our efforts here, you need to be searching the scriptures. You don't need to accept anything that I say because I say it or anything that Dennis says because he says it or even your elders here, your leaders. You need to always compare what they're saying with what? The good book. And if it's in harmony with the book, then you want to believe it, you know, wholeheartedly. So a disciple is someone who searches uh, the scripture. A disciple involves someone who is not only a listener of the word, but what? A doer of the word. See, you know all of this. Matthew 7, you remember 21, beginning, the Lord said, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. But then notice the next one. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, 
Have we not prophesied in your name and in your name cast out devils and in your name done many wonderful works? Then will I profess to them what? I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. Why, Lord? Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them will be likened unto a man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall. Right? But whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a man who built his house on the sand. And what? Same thing. Rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And so a disciple is someone who hears, but also who does. I suppose James might have the classic passage on that, Dennis, that we've quoted many times. James 1, 22, Be doers of the word, and not, what? Hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like a man who beholds himself in a mirror and then he goes his way and he immediately forgets you know what manner of person he was but whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein he being not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work now watch it this man shall be blessed in all that he does so think about it I love this mirror illustration I liken it to something like this You've been outside, you've been working hard, and maybe in your yard or garden or whatever, and um, you're, you know, uh, dusty, your hands are dirty and so forth, and so you go into uh, your house and you're washing your hands at the sink, and as you're washing your hands, you're looking in the mirror, and you say, wow, I got dirt all over my face. You keep washing your hands, and then you uh, dry your hands, and then what? You walk out the house. What'd you do about your face? Nothing. What you did was look in the mirror, and the mirror told you your face is dirty too. You see, that, that's just a person who is listening and not doing, who just sees that he is dirty but does not do anything about it. And so the Bible teaches us that we should look into this book, and then we should find out what we need to know in this book, and then we need to do it, not just to listen to it. How many of, of uh, us parents have said, well, girl, that's going in one ear and out the other. You've heard that, haven't you? Of course you have. You've said it, right? His life and I raised three girls. I know what I'm talking about here. Hard head. <laughs> Any of you ever say that? That might be a Mississippi expression. Do you hear the words coming out of my mouth? Apparently not. Yeah. We want to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And so what does that mean? Well, how do we explain it in practice? Well, if you want to be a person who abides in the Word, wouldn't you take advantage of Bible class like this? There are some, perhaps, in this congregation who are not taking advantage of our Bible classes. Are they disciples indeed? See? A disciple indeed is somebody who's going to abide in the Word. A disciple indeed would, want, would be someone who, if there's an activity going on at the, um, at the building, then we want to be there. We want to be part of the activity. Now, we all understand there are circumstances you know, that um, um, are exemptions to this. Some people are caregivers. I understand that. You understand it. Some are nurses. Some are doctors. Some are, are, um, are uh, fire persons. You can't say fireman anymore. What's her name? Firefighter. Thank you. Reason I need her right here. Okay. Because in Mississippi, we don't have all that political correctness down yet. I'm working on it, though. Been working on it about 100 years, it seems like. But anyway, so we want to be people who take advantage of our opportunities to study the Word. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Thank you. All right, number two, turn to John 13. You ready? John chapter 13. <clears throat> In John chapter 13, the Lord Jesus, his farewell address uh, begins at verse 31. In the uh, first 12 chapters of John, Jesus has presented himself to the public. He's been preaching. After chapter 12, he does not preach anymore in the Gospel of John. 
He, he spends his time with his disciples with a few statements uh, to uh, Annas, the high priest, and Pilate, and uh, Herod, and you know, few, just a few short you know, statements and his statements on the cross. But he is spending time with the disciples. Well, after the betrayer leaves in John 13, Jesus begins his farewell address, his farewell remarks to his apostles, his 11 apostles. Okay, Judas has left the room. And um, after a brief introduction, he says this in verse 34, A new commandment give I unto you, a new commandment give I unto you, that you what? Love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this will all men know that you are my, say it, disciples, if you love one another. See? There's our passage. And it's got the word disciple in it. So what's the second mark of a disciple? A disciple is someone who loves one another. Now someone says, well now, is that talking about you know the um, um, passage about loving your neighbor? Well, Jesus says it's a new commandment. You know, love your neighbor, that's all the way back in Leviticus. So how is it new? Well, notice that Jesus says, as I have loved you, you see. And so it's new in the sense that they have now seen true love demonstrated in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. Y'all, all all of you get that? That's the way I think, Dennis. It is a new commandment. The new commandment give I unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. You see, they've seen it. They've seen love demonstrated. Okay? Now notice that the emphasis of the passage is love one another. Now what are you talking about there? Does that include love your neighbor? Well, I think... In some sense, you know, it does. But your neighbor, you know, could be the person down the street, right? But what about love one another? What does that sound like? That sounds like us right here, doesn't it? And if you think about the background, it really makes a lot of sense. What was going on just prior to Jesus making this statement? John does not tell us, but you find it, you know, in Luke. The disciples were arguing with one another. And also, in other Gospels, you find that James and John, along with their mama, you know, were vying for positions um, to sit by the Lord Jesus when he came in the kingdom. You remember that too, don't you? And what was the disciples' reaction to that? They were indignant, and they resented the fact that they were doing that. And so... It's pretty clear here that the background is that the disciples were arguing with each other. They were resentful of one another. Some were angry, you know, with one another. I mean, if you just think about John 13, it's known as the episode of the washing of of feet. Who's doing the washing? Jesus. Who's supposed to be doing the washing? One of the disciples. And um, it's been suggested that it would have fallen to the youngest, and that's been speculated that John the Apostle would have been the youngest. But, you know, even John, who, you know, was loved by the Lord and who loved the Lord so very, very much, he didn't even do it, okay? You know, he did not do it. Now, why wouldn't one of the disciples wash the disciples' feet? Because as soon as one of the disciples put on the towel of a bondservant, and started washing the feet of the other disciples, they would have, in effect, been saying, what about themselves? I'm not the most important. (laughs) You see, I'm not the greatest, and I'm not about to get down there on my knees and wash anybody's feet because I'm more important than anybody else. And so what Jesus does is set the example. I'm the Lord. You're my disciple. And even I am willing, you know, to... Bow down and wash your feet. So a disciple is somebody who loves the brethren. They love one another. It's just overwhelming again to me that here's Jesus. What time is this? This is on on Thursday night. We call it Thursday night. It's actually on Friday morning according to the Jewish calendar. And that's really confusing because their day started, you know, at uh, dusk, twilight. But anyway, 
for uh, our purposes, I'll just say Thursday night. When did the Lord die? Friday. So here's Jesus, Dennis, staring death in the face. Now just think about this. And he knows what's going to happen to him. Is I, am I right about that? He knows. You know, John 2.25 said that he didn't need to be told what was in man. He knew what was in man. So Jesus knows what's going to happen to him. And in spite of the fact that he knew he was going to be mocked and scourged and crucified, in spite of that, what is he interested in? He's interested in ensuring that the disciples love each other. I'm telling you, if I knew I was going to be dying tomorrow, I'm not sure I'd be too interested in you guys. I'm just being frank about it. That's just the human in me, okay? But here's the Lord Jesus. Above all things, he wanted the disciples, you know, to quit their arguing and to love each other. In essence, he's saying, before I die, I want you guys to learn to love each other. Wow, what an amazing thought. And so, uh, do you love each other? You say, well, of course, preacher, I, you know, I love, love Dennis, I love Kathy, I love, you know, the elders, I love, you know, the deacons. I love everybody in the church. I can easily hear you saying that. I hope you're not like one person I met one time, and he was having some trouble at his congregation, and he said, Bro, like, he said, I love the brethren. All right, no, he didn't, I'm, I messed it up. He said, I love the church. He said, but it's just the brethren I can't stand. <laughs> I thought, brother, I said, the church is made up of the brethren. Is that not right? You can't separate the church from the brethren. I said, what do you mean you love the church, but that you really can't stand being around the brethren? That's ridiculous. It's absurd, isn't it? Of course it is. And so, a disciple who loves one another in practice, would it not be a person who takes time you know, for his brother or sister? Let me ask it to you this way. Did Jesus take time for other people? What about John chapter 4? You know, that whole narrative you know, with the Samaritan woman about the, you know, uh, giving living water, to whom did the Lord say that? He said it to the Samaritan woman. Uh, I should have mentioned John 3 first. What about Nicodemus? Over, John has countless interviews where Jesus took time to be with people. So if, you, if you're a true, a true disciple and you love the brethren, you've got to spend time with people. And so what, could, what else could we do? What else could we do? Well, we could take advantage of opportunities to come together, to fellowship with each other, right? We're going to do that some today, I think. We want to take advantage of opportunities like that. You see, when you get to know one another, then people, um, <clears throat> if I get to know Dennis really, really well, then uh, he's going to put more trust in me and vice versa, see. And then when that happens between two people, then when a person has problems in his or her life, what will they have a tendency to do? They'll have a tendency to go to that person, right? And to share with that person and to ask for prayer by that person. You see, that's what happens when you build up relationships, you know, with people. And so we have to, you know, love one another. You know, Philippians 2 says, Mind not your own things, but the things of others. I told a little congregation where I preach that um, generally speaking, I don't want to be in your business, and I don't want you in my business. But when it comes to the Lord and the Lord's church, your business is my business. And I went to that Philippians passage. Mind not your own things, but the things of others. You see, I would be remiss if I had a brother or a sister you know, who was forsaking the assembling of ourselves together or whatever they might be involved in, if I didn't take time to say something to that person. That's what it means to love one another. Well, who is a disciple? Turn to John chapter 15. A disciple is someone who bears fruit. John chapter 15. Listen to those pages. I love it. Okay. Now notice this. 
As I was, when I was writing the commentary, Dennis, I picked up on this, I think, for the first time. In John 15 and 2, notice that it says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Okay? And then also in verse 2, it says, he bears fruit in order that he might have more fruit. You see it? In 4, you got bear fruit again. In 5, you got bear much fruit. And then in verse 8, the passage that I want us to look at, the Bible says, By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. And then guess what? So will you be my, what? Disciples. But did you see the progression in this gospel here, in John chapter 15? Bear fruit, bear what? More fruit, bear what? Bear much fruit. So a disciple is someone who bears much fruit. Now then the question arises, well, uh, what does it mean to bear fruit? Well, when I was thinking about this, Dennis, I thought, well, one thing to me would be Romans chapter 7 and verse 4. You know, where Paul says, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that you should bring forth what? Fruit unto God. I've wondered, uh, Brother Dennis, if that's more of an evangelistic thrust, you know, right there. And similarly, in um, Philippians 1 and 22, where Paul says, you know, he's in a strait betwixt two, wanting to be with the Lord, but, you know, needing to stay with the brethren also, that he may bear fruit. I think the fruit bearing there has to do with evangelistic uh, goals of winning souls to Christ. But then a disciple is going to bear fruit like the fruit of the Spirit, correct? Galatians chapter 5. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against these things there is no law. And so a true disciple then is going to be somebody who bears fruit, either through evangelistic efforts or through developing those uh, virtues that we just uh, noted. Now what if you don't bear fruit? What did Jesus say in John 15? Because of time, I won't go back to it. What did he say? What do you do, what do, you do to some of you who may have some kind of um, vine that don't bear fruit? What do you do to them? You cut them off. Isn't that right? Not doing anything. Not bearing any fruit. And similarly, that's what the Lord will do to us if we don't bear fruit. All right, now with that, let's raise the question real quick, the cost of being a disciple. And with that, go to Luke chapter 14 for me, please. Now, how many passages have we already looked at? Four. The goal of a disciple, Luke 6 and 40. The marks of a disciple, where? John 8, 31, 13, 34, 35, and 15, 8. We've already looked at four, so we have three more. A, a true disciple, and by the way, I say true disciple because the Bible speaks of disciples in different ways. You know, in John 6, you remember the Lord fed 5,000 and then they left him? Remember that? The Bible says the disciples left him. So see, I call those guys the temporary disciples. Or in John 8, you know, where that man wanted to bury his father? You remember that? The Bible says he was a disciple. Uh, but appears to me to be a temporary disciple. But I'm talking about true disciples. Here are true disciples. Number one, Luke 14, 26. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, and his children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my, what? Disciple. So this means that Jesus comes first. Jesus must come first. Now, the passage is not saying for us to literally hate our parents or our spouses or our siblings. It's not saying that. That would be absurd. That'd go against, you know, plain teaching in the Bible. Matthew helps us in Matthew 10 and 37 when he says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. An Old Testament illustration might be Genesis 29, uh, around 30, 31, <laughs> where the Bible says that Jacob loved Rachel and hated Leah. He didn't hate Leah in the sense 
of the, you know, the bad sense of the word hate. But who did he work his liver out for for seven years? Hello? Rachel? And then what did, what, who did he get? He got Leah. Well, Rachel was the one he had on his mind, so he, he loved her more. Okay, but at any rate, so Jesus has got to come first, even over your family. We baptized a young lady at International Bible College when I taught there back in the 80s with men like Brother Charlie Coyle, um, good Arkansas man. All, you know Brother Charlie Coyle, some of you? One of my heroes, great gospel preacher. Studied with this young lady. And she said, my daddy has told me that if I'm baptized, he'll put me out of the house. I didn't really know exactly what to say to that, so I turned to Luke 14, 26. And I said, would you read this passage for me, miss? And she read it. And I said, now what do you think you need to do? She said, I need to be baptized. And guess what? Heard Brother Wendell. Her daddy put her out of the house. But guess what? We found her a place to stay. You see, that's what brothers and sisters do, right? They help each other. But we've got to be sure that Jesus comes first in our life. Uh, I went to school, in high school, with a young lady. I was kind of, I was kind of sweet on her. Uh, <clears throat> I'd already met his life over here, but she was up in the north in Detroit, and I, I was a long way off, you know, and I was getting kind of lonely, you know, but anyway, I had one date with her, and I, I wanted to follow up on that, but uh, there was this, uh, her ex-boyfriend was a big football player, and I weighed like 129 pounds, and I said, hmm, I'm not sure I want to pursue this anymore. <laughs> Anyway, her name was Frances. She and her sister Martha were members of the church. And they had a sweet mother who was a member of the church. And Martha and Frances' daddy hated the church so much that he would not even put in the house running water for them. I'm talking the 60s now. Now, I was raised for several, I was born in 49, and I was raised several years without running water, you know, in a house. So I know everything that goes with not having running water, including what's out back, okay? I know about that. And I thought these two precious young Christian ladies, along with their precious mother, not ever having just a, a, a basic... Um, you know, thing in life because a man hated the church, you know, so bad. But you know what? They never gave up. They put Jesus first. We got to do that. Amen? Jesus got to come first. Now, what does first mean? Well, it means first, right? I don't know how to explain it anymore. Can I illustrate it? I don't know how you, uh, we're about to run out of time here, but don't y'all don't disappear or anything. I'm going to finish my point, okay? Maybe I'm the one that will disappear. I don't know. But anyway, we're going to have a fellowship today, right? Now, I don't know how you do it here, but here's the way I've done it in places I've worked. For some reason, it fails me to call everybody to order. So everybody's working. You know how you do. You're setting plates and you're moving things around and so forth. And then usually a sister would ease up to me and say, uh, David, we're ready. You do something like that, and then I'd clap my hands or, or something, and I'd say, all right, y'all, let me have your attention. The sisters say we're ready. You have to say that a couple of times, you know, quieting everybody down, right? And then I would say something like this. Now, here's the way we're going to do it. We're going to have a prayer of thanksgiving, and after our prayer, we're going to ask our visitors to go help me out. First, I've been preaching for 54 years. Did you know that in all the fellowships I have ever been to, not once, not once, Brother Horton, have I ever witnessed one visitor leaning over to another saying, do you know what that means? 
Have you? Have you ever heard anybody say that? Of course not. Why? Because we know what first means. Is that right or wrong? You see? Sometime in the spring, you may announce, we want to congratulate, you know, Lucille, uh, who was first in her class. You don't have a lot of whispering. Oh, what does that mean? Everybody knows what that means. So we know what first means. It's not a cognitive issue. It is a practical issue. Isn't that right? First. We know what it means. Okay. Let's see. It's Friday evening. Honey, what do you think? Think we ought to go to the river this weekend? You know, we could go to the river. I could run some trot lines. And, and uh, you could just kick back. And we could do that. And then Sunday evening, we could go back home and be ready for work. What, what about that? Does that work or not? No, it doesn't work. Why? Because you're not putting the Lord first. The river. I hate the stinking river. I'll just be frank about it. Y'all have a river near here? Well, you got problems. How many doors have I knocked on and said, missed you Sunday? Was that the river? That's what they say. I hate it. Let me tell you something. Jesus comes before the river. That's weak. That amen is weak. Am I right or wrong? Amen? Pitiful when you have to beg for it. But anyway, I'll take it. All right? And then, so Jesus has got to come first. All right, number two. Where is it? Won't spend as much time on it. Number 27. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There it is. That is our number, what? Um, Is that six? That's the sixth place that we found the word disciple for our lesson today. Have you got a cross to bear? I have a cross to bear. You have a cross to bear. Everybody's got a cross to bear. All who will live godly in Christ Jesus are going to suffer persecution. Peter said in 1 Peter 4 and 12, don't think it's strange when you fall into a fiery trial. There's some strange thing that happened to you. What's he saying? Expect it, correct? (laughs) And so we all have crosses to bear. And then look at the next and uh, the final one. It's verse 33. I hardly have time just to mention it. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. So what are the costs of being a disciple? First of all, we've got to put Jesus first. Number two, we've got to bear our cross. Number three, we've got to forsake our stuff. You have stuff? Boy, i got stuff. i got stuff, you got stuff, all God's children got stuff. If you don't believe it, just leave it. We were at Free Hardeman on campus. I taught there. I taught 25 years, but taught on campus 20 years, and then we moved. Man, did I have stuff. Moving my shop was like moving a whole house. I mean, I had welders, I had torches, I had, you know, hot rods, I had, well, I had a car trailer, thankfully, like five trips, you know, shop stuff on a car trailer. Stuff, we got stuff. What should be our attitude towards stuff? Get rid of all of it? I don't think it's wrong for us to have stuff. We just got to realize, you know, where stuff fits in in our relationship to Jesus. Not once have we ever allowed our stuff to come between us and service to the Lord. I have friends call me. We're going to a big car show. You know, start Sunday morning. Sorry, I can't go. Well, you say that every year. I say, yeah, don't even ask me anymore. I'm not going to do it. Is that right or wrong? Say, I'm not going to do that. Well, it's one of the, I don't care how great it is. Well, we might, you know, there might be a celebrity there. Uh, Chip Foose may be there. Well, fine, y'all enjoy. I wish you'd stay home and go to church with me. So we have to forsake our stuff. The rich young ruler's problem was not that he had stuff. His problem was he was not willing, you know, to have Jesus in the right order with his stuff. You see what I'm saying? All of us have, you know, material, you know, things that we enjoy. Some of you may be fishermen. Some of you may be hunters. Some of you may be 
um, I don't know, whatever, you can fill in the blank. And there's nothing wrong with any of that until we allow it to take precedence over our relationship with the Lord Jesus. Amen? Amen. All right, you're doing better. So we have some costs that we have to experience. I have a whole other lesson here, but we, we're out of time. Thank you all for your good attention. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for this good day. We love the first day of the week, and we are grateful for the opportunity to come together in order to study your word, to love each other, to spend time with one another, and to approach you in prayer. Father, we pray that what we say and do today will be acceptable in your sight and that we'll give glory and honor to your high and holy name. Watch over us throughout the rest of this service today and throughout the shades of this evening. Forgive our transgressions, for it's in Jesus' name that we humbly beg it. Amen.